A big part of being ready for the CPC exam is practice, 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 which is why I put together this video where we can go over some practice questions that will get you ready for the CPC exam. If you're new here on Victoria, I'm a medical coder, auditor, educator, and content creator. And on my channel, I provide tips, tricks, and tutorials to help you be successful in a medical coding career. If you haven't already, highly encourage you to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you can get alerts when I post new episodes. Now, I want to go over some practice cases for the CPC exam. I have 10 of them put together, a nice variety, med term, ICD-10 CM, CPT, HIC picks, even an E and M in there. But let's start out by going over some basics of the CPC exam. So first off, who is eligible to take the CPC exam? There's no requirement for the CPC exam that you have to go through a certain program, an approved program, a college program, an AEPC approved instructor. The two eligibility criteria for the CPC exam are that you have to be an active member of the AAPC and you have to pay for the exam fee. Other than that, it's really up to you how you want to train. Of course, if you don't have any training, you might not fare very well on the exam, or if you don't have the correct training, you might not fare very well on the exam, which is why I recommend programs like Preppy. You can find out more at mymedicalcodingmasterclass.com. But as far as eligibility, you don't need to prove that you took the prerequisites. You just need to be a member and pay the exam fee. You have two options of where to take the CPC exam. You can take it at an exam center, or you can take it during a remote live proctor, which means you can take it from your home or at a hotel or a library. But there are requirements there as far as privacy. You can't have anyone else in the room. You can't have pets moving in around the room. It has to be nothing on the desk. So definitely reference the AEPC website for what those requirements are for the live remote proctor. One of the requirements is that you have to have an external webcam and stuff like that. Prior to 2024, the AEPC in-person exams were administered via local chapters and they were on paper. Now the exams are all 100% electronic. It's just that you can take them electronically at the exam center or with the live remote proc. What is on the CPC exam? There are currently 100 questions on the CPC exam. Of course, that might change. There's been some indications that at some point the AAPC might consider adding in some fill in the blank questions. I will definitely keep you posted on this channel when and if that happens. Currently, it's 100 questions. There are four questions on anatomy, three compliance and regulatory, seven on coding guidelines, five ICD 10 CM questions, three HICPIX level two questions, which honestly is why a lot of organizations and, and educational places don't concentrate much on HICPIX because there's really only three questions on it on the exam. And if you figured out ICD 10 CM and CPT HICPIX isn't that difficult afterwards, there are six questions each for the 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, and 60,000 code series, six on radiology, six on path and lab, six medicine questions, and six E&M questions, four on anesthesia, and then 10 cases. Cases are basically an operative report or a long note, and then they will ask you a question based off of that case. Certain other AAPC exams, they might have cases as well, but they might ask you three or four questions or two questions on that case. For the CPC exam, they have indicated that it is 10 cases, one question each. If you have the AAPC curriculum and you have those practical application cases, they're a lot like that. For the AAPC exam, you'll need to bring a photo ID because they need to verify that the correct person is taking the exam. Could you imagine what kind of racket they would have if they didn't check that? I'm sure there would be people out there that would be like, hey, I'll take your exam for you. Just pay me X amount of dollars. Like they have to make sure that it's the right person. You can bring any edition of the ICD-10CM book that you want. You can bring your CPT book, but only the AMA professional edition on any edition of the HICPICS book that you like. Now, what about notes in your books? I get a lot of questions about notes in your books, and I always reference back to the AAPC. They are the authoritative source of what is and is not permitted. So if you ask Victoria, hey, I did this in my exam, will they accept it? I really can't tell you definitively. I can give you the guidance, though, of what is on the AAPC website. Handwritten notes are acceptable in the coding books only if they pertain to daily coding activities. Questions from the study guides, practice exams, or the exam itself are prohibited. Tabs may be inserted, taped, 
pasted, glued, or stapled in the manual so long as the obvious intent of the tab is to earmark a page with words or numbers, not supplement information in the book. That's why they often check for post-it notes when they are flipping through your books because that's supplemental information in the book. Altering, whiting out, painting, or printing over any pages within the code book, such as the marketing pages, table of contents, reference pages, etc., to supplement information is prohibited. No materials other than the tab dividers may be inserted, taped, pasted, glued, or stapled in the manuals, and there is the URL at the bottom for reference of that. What year's books should you use? So, since the code sets are based off of the calendar year's books, you really should have the calendar year books. The AAPC strongly suggests you use the current year's books. The exams are updated in January. It says here, Previous calendar year's books may be used on the exam, but you would be at a disadvantage doing so. Now, people will ask me, well, uh, it's 2024. I have the books from 2022. Is that going to be permitted? I want to highlight for you that this says year singular apostrophe S possessive. So that means one year. If it was multiple calendar years, it would be S and then the apostrophe. So my thought is they mean one prior calendar year not multiple years prior. Is it possible that your proctor isn't going to care and they might just shuffle you through and not pay attention to what year the book is? It's entirely possible. You're also not permitted to use the upcoming year's books. Books older than one year are not allowed for exam use. Just kind of reiterating that here. It is boop, 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 in there. Again, I'm sure people have slid by with older books than that, but the official guidance is current calendar year or one calendar year prior. Examinees using their second attempt in the next calendar year will not be permitted to take the previous year's exam. So if you're taking your exam, for example, in December of 2024 and you do not pass, and then you want to retake in January of 2025, you can't take the 2024 version. You have to take the 2025 version of the exam. Now let's just get into some questions for the exam, starting out with some med term. What is the primary function of the alveoli in the human respiratory system? Is it A, to transport oxygen from atmosphere to the blood, B, to produce mucus to trap foreign particles, C, to facilitate the exchange of gases between the air and blood, or D, to regulate the flow of air in the lungs? Now, with these type of questions, sometimes your anatomy pictures can be helpful. If this is something that you want to write notes on, I would say go to your anatomy photos of the lungs, your illustrations, and write some notes in there about the functions of the respiratory system. In this case, it is C, to facilitate the exchange of gases between the air and blood. Now let's get into some ICD 10 cm questions. A 50 year old patient has been diagnosed with elevated blood pressure, but does not have a history of hypertension. What is the correct ICD-10-CM code for this condition? Now, it's important to note that we have diagnoses for hypertension, but in order to designate the hypertension code, we have to have physician documentation specifically saying this patient has hypertension, not just an isolated elevated blood pressure read. So what do we do in these situations? This is a common question that comes up during the exam and during the study material. So you might wind up seeing something very similar to this on your exam. We have RO 3.0. And if we see our I codes there, we know I 10, that's one of the first codes we learn I 10 is hypertension. So this patient doesn't have hypertension. We can maybe process of elimination this, right? So if I see all these I codes and I'm like, oh my gosh, I know that I 10 is a hypertension and I 13 is a hypertension code and I 15 is a hypertension code. Our codes, those are like our sign symptom stuff, right? So we could possibly use the process of elimination here and go, oh yeah, RO3. But what would that look like if we look it up in our book? So for this one, we're going to start with our E for elevated. We're going to go over to our EL elevated. And if we see down here, elevated blood pressure reading, incidental, isolated, no diagnosis of hypertension, RO3.0. So for this case, RO3.0 is our correct code for the elevated blood pressure. Next case, we have a 43-year-old patient diagnosed with idiopathic gastroparesis. Which ICD-10-CM code should be used to accurately represent this diagnosis? We have options of K3184, K3189, 
K31.9 and K59.00. So what I would suggest we do is maybe look at these K31 codes and start right there and see if we can really quickly just on that one page, maybe where the K31s are, find that code and see if we can easily determine what the correct answer is there. By the way, if you like these tabs that I have in my book, they are from Medical Coding Tabs Co. I will link them below because I know I do get a lot of questions about where I get them. So the potential codes we're looking at is K31, 8, 4, 8, 9, or 9, or this K59.0. So if none of those fit, we'll go and check K59.0. But here we are, K51.8 is over here. K51.84 is gastroparesis, 8, 9 is other diseases. K31.9 itself is diseases of stomach and duodenum but I'm really liking this K31.84, which is our code for gastroparesis. Now you could look this up in the alphabetic index. You could start with gastroparesis and that will take you to K31.84. And there's no further specificity of the gastroparesis there. So if we look at this, our correct answer is the K31.84. Getting a little further in depth with ICD-10-CM, we have a 55-year-old patient receiving ongoing chemotherapy for primary malignant neoplasm of the liver. Which set of ICD-10-CM codes would best capture the scenario? Now, when we look at this, there's a couple of things we can note here, right? We have some C codes for cancer, and then we have some Z codes here, right? And there's some sequencing differences. One of them has the cancer code first, and then the other has this Z code second. We have the Z11, Z51.11 repeated here a couple of times here, here, and here. We have a Z51.2. So if that's Z51.11, we can eliminate A. We could eliminate some things based off of some sequencing guidelines. So when I look at this, I'm thinking, okay, chemotherapy and cancer, I know there is a guideline regarding this and the sequencing. So that might be one of your best bets. Let's take a look at that guideline, actually. If we look at our neoplasm guidelines, it says that the patient admission or encounter is chiefly for the admission of chemotherapy, immunotherapy, and radiation therapy. It says here Z51.11 is the encounter for antineoplastic chemotherapy, and that that would be the first listed or principal diagnosis. So just based off of that alone, we can eliminate our option B and we can eliminate our option A because those, this one doesn't have the right sequencing. It put the cancer code first and it says that the chemotherapy has to go first. And this one, the Z51.2 isn't the right code for chemotherapy. So now we're gonna have to determine is this C22.8 or C22.9? And we can do that with a quick look up in our book. So here are our C22 codes. We have C22. 0.8 and 0.9. This is primary neoplasm of the liver. This one is malignant neoplasm of the liver, not specified as primary or secondary. And if we look back on our case, it does in fact specify that this was primary, primary malignancy. So we're going to use our C22.8. So this would be our option C, the Z51.11 and C22.8. Now let's get into some questions on CPT. A 42 year old male patient undergoes surgical repair of a four centimeter incarcerated umbilical hernia. Which CPT code should be used for this procedure? We have 49505, 49594, 49593, 49585. Now again, this is one that we could potentially use the process of elimination for. It looks like the codes are close together. We could just go ahead and look up the codes. It let, For this one, let's actually start in the index. Sometimes people want to know what it looks like when we check the index first. However, if it was me personally, I would probably start going over to those 4959 codes and kind of start around there. So of course with CPT, our index is in the back and we're going to start with R for repair. Let's see what happens is if we go here to repair abdomen hernia, it's gonna give us these whole code ranges, which are basically our code options. So not super helpful in this instance. Sometimes it is, but in this one, it really wasn't. We could also check hernia repair. Now that might give us some better information here. 
this one was an umbilical hernia so umbilical this was not listed as recurrent so it would be an initial and here's the code range that it's giving us 49591 49596 which means it's probably our B or C options, which I was gonna start looking at those anyway. So it starts here, repair the anterior abdominal hernias, such as umbilical, and then they break down by size. So this particular one was four centimeters incarcerated. So here we have three to 10 reducible, three to 10, which is where four falls in, incarcerated or strangulated, 49594. So in this case, our answer is going to be our 49594 for the four centimeter incarcerated umbilical hernia. Now we're going to get into an E&M question. I'll read this through for you. Subjective, 50 year old female established to this office reports a persistent cough and mild chest discomfort over the past two weeks. She denies fever, but mentions occasional shortness of breath during physical activity. Objective vital signs are stable. Physical examination reveals mild wheezing in the lower lobes bilaterally. No signs of respiratory distress are present. Assessment bronchitis. Plan prescribe a course of amoxicillin 500 milligrams and accommodate rest fluids and follow up visit for one week. Patient education was provided about monitoring symptoms and when to see further medical care. Which CPT code best represents the level of service for this encounter? Now, if we were going to start in our code book and just look up these codes with e &M, that's not as helpful because it just tells you this one is a low risk, this one is a moderate risk. Now, with the electronic exams, there is going to be some e &M calculators that are embedded in the exam. They are the AAPC version of them, so it's not like you're going to have the AMA spreadsheet that you can pop up. But the EM information is in your book. So starting on page nine is the medical decision making table. It doesn't look like the sheet that you have. I don't know why they didn't just turn it sideways and put it in there. They had to put it on, I think it's two pages, three pages, two pages. So if we look at this case here, a couple of things I want to note was this patient had prescription drug management, amoxicillin, but this was a pretty straightforward problem. So normally when we think prescription drug management, we're like, oh man, that's moderate. That's going to be like a level four, but we didn't have one or more chronic illnesses. We didn't have two or more stable chronic illnesses. This isn't an undiagnosed new problem with an uncertain prognosis. There was no systemic symptoms. It was just bronchitis and it wasn't complicated. So really as far as the number and complexity of problems addressed, it's falling more here on low where it is an acute uncomplicated illness. So even though we hit that prescription drug management here, we have to at least meet or exceed here. We did exceed in the low category. We have two of the three that we need. So this is a low medical decision-making problem. Where does that place us for our e &M level? As far as our two out of the three elements of medical decision-making, if we look at the grid that's in our book here, we have our office outpatient visits established. So our low medical decision-making will put us here at the 99213. So for this case, it is option B, the 99213. Let's get into an anesthesia question. What is the appropriate CPT code for anesthesia provided during a total knee arthroplasty. So how do we look this one up? I am not the best person with anesthesia. I also love just going right to the book. So I'm seeing that there's two codes here that are close together, 01400 and 01402. So I'm just going to flip over to those pages. Here's my anesthesia and I'm going to start over with 01400. So this is for a total knee arthroplasty and we are here in the knee and popliteal area and our 400 anesthesia for open or surgical arthroscopic procedures of the knee joint not otherwise specified and if we look right here here's our total knee arthroplasty 01402 which is what this was this was a total knee arthroplasty now the other options we have were 80 80 we can see is here under the lower leg so below the knee so that wouldn't be right 382 is for diagnostic, so that wasn't right either because this was a total knee arthroplasty. So the correct answer for this case for the total knee arthroplasty anesthesia would be 01402. 
Now let's combine some CPT and ICD-10 CM. So even though on the CPC exam it says there's going to be so many questions about CPT and so many questions about ICD-10 CM, you will see some combined questions where they're going to ask you about CPT and ICD-10 CM on the same question. This might even be a fair one for saying a case. The case might be a little bit longer, but this is a, a fair assessment of it. 58 year old patient presents to the emergency department after slipping on ice and sustaining an injury to the right ankle. Radiographic imaging confirms an acute closed bimalleolar ankle fracture. The orthopedic surgeon performs an open reduction and internal fixation of the bimalleolar ankle fracture. What are the appropriate CPT and ICD-10-CM codes for this patient's surgical procedure and diagnoses? So what are we coding for here? We're coding for an open reduction internal fixation of this bimalleolar ankle fracture. That's going to be our procedure. And the ankle fracture is also going to be our diagnosis code. So we're going to code for this ORIF, open reduction internal fixation of the bimalleolar ankle fracture. Again, I think because these codes are so close together, process of elimination, I'm just going to look them up in the code book first. So options A and B are both 27814. So I have a good feeling about that one because they're using it twice. Our other options are 808 and 822. But if we look right over here, the open treatment of the bimalleolar ankle fracture and it says includes internal fixation when performed. So open, reduction, internal fixation. That sounds like it's the right thing. So let's check the other ones. So 808 is closed treatment, and that's not what we did, we did an open treatment. And 822 is open treatment of a trimalleolar ankle fracture, and that's not what we did. So we can eliminate our couple options here. We know it's either going to be A and B, so we can eliminate some of our other options. We know it's not going to be C. We know it's not going to be D. So it's going to be either our option A or B. So we're going to narrow it down to looking at is this S82841 or 844. So let's bring back out our ICD-10CM book. So the difference here is going to be this is our displaced of the right lower leg. This is non-displaced of the bimalleolar fracture of the right lower leg. Now, if the documentation doesn't specify if it's displaced or non-displaced, we have to know our guidelines here or go back and reference them. The default would be displaced. So in this case, it would be our option A. So CPT code 27814 and the S82.841A initial encounter for the displaced bimalleolar ankle fracture. Here we have another CPT and ICD-10-CM example. 65-year-old patient presents with severe lower back pain and radiating leg pain. Diagnostic imaging reveals grade two spondylolisthesis at the L4, L5 level with significant nerve root compression. Patient undergoes a laminectomy with removal of abnormal facets and pars articularis with de decompression of the cauda equina and the nerve roots gill type procedure at the L4, L5 level. What are the appropriate CPT and ICD-10-CM codes for this patient's surgical procedure and diagnosis? Now we can see, we can eliminate half of them if we can figure out if this is M43.17 or M34.16. I already have my ICD-10-CM book out because I just was using it for the previous case. So I'm going to start there and determine that. So what is our diagnosis here? It's not the lower back pain. It's not the radiating leg pain. Those are the signs and symptoms, which we don't code when we have a definitive diagnosis. So this is the grade two spondylolisthesis at the L4, L5. So if we look here, M4316, is for the lumbar region, 1-7 is lumbosacral, L4, L5 is lumbar, L for lumbar. It's not down into our lumbosacral just yet. So this would be the 1-6, meaning we can eliminate our answers A and B. So we can eliminate our options A and B because we know it's not lumbosacral, it's just lumbar. Now, what is our procedure in this case? Our procedure is going to be the laminectomy with the removal of the abnormal facets 
and the decompression. So that's the code we're going to look for. Is it going to be this L? Is it going to be 63047 or 63012? So let's flip over to our CBT book. So 63012 is laminectomy with removal of abnormal facets and or pars interarticularis with decompression of quadra equina and nerve roots for spondylolisthesis lumbar gill type procedure, which sounds pretty good, but let's just double check what that 63047 is. Yes, 63047 doesn't look like it's what we are looking for lumbar it's in the right region but in this case definitely is going to be our 63012 and our m43.16 our option d now let's take a look at a hick picks question this is a patient they have post-surgical nausea and vomiting and they are administered four milligrams of iv zofran what is the appropriate HICPICS code for this medication? Now with drug codes, those are our J codes and we have to pay really close attention to the dosage and make sure that we're billing the right units based off of the dosage. And of course now reporting things like drug waste. So when we look at this one, we can see J2405 is repeated three times. So chances are good that they're trying to test us on that code and they want us to know dosage appropriately. So you can use your table in your HICPIX book if you're looking up drug codes. There is a drug table, but in this case for the exam, I'm gonna say let's just go over to our J2405 and take a look. So here is our J2405 injection, and it says here per one milligram, and it is Zofran, lists the drug name down here. So this patient had four milligrams, which means this is billed per one milligram. We're going to bill four units of J2405. We can tell this is the correct one. The other one was J9400, which doesn't even sound like it's in the right area. So four units of that one is going to take us to our J2405 times four. And those are our cases for practice for the CPC exam. If you have specific other types of cases you would love for me to cover, definitely let me know in the comments below. Otherwise, if you need more practice, you can check out my CPC review that I have for sale. It is not the same as anything else that I have on YouTube. And I also have a full review playlist that you can check out right over here. Otherwise, I will see you guys in the next video. And until then, just keep on coding on.